All right. Well, good morning. I know we have audio because now I can hear it. Um, I hope everyone had a wonderful evening last night and um, happy Wednesday. Uh, we are here to speak about uh, middle school ELA and the Savas platform. Uh, I'm Elaine Abanatha, digital innovation leader here in JCPS. And with me, my awesome team this morning, we have Suzanne Kramer. Good morning, Suzanne. Good morning. We're really happy to be here. Yes. Good morning, Diane Cole. Diane is here as well. Good morning. And and then we have and then we have Brandon Abden, who is um, with Savas for us. So. Good morning. Good morning. All right, Brandon, I am ready to um, allow, let's go ahead and learn and see how we can implement this, this uh, platform and curriculum with our students. Excellent. Thank you, Elaine, and uh, welcome everyone this morning. Um, yes, my name is Brandon Abden, and I'm an educational consultant with Savas Learning. Um, and uh, just coincidentally, uh, having asked to, to work on this project, uh, I'm from Kentucky uh, originally, so, uh, and I uh, live in Cincinnati now and go back to Kentucky all the time. That's where my heart is, so I'm excited to, to work with this. Um, so I'm going to take a few minutes and just introduce the overall basics of the platform. Um, and then when it, I transitioned over to Suzanne, Suzanne's going to talk about uh, things related directly to ELA content at the middle school level. And so if you have any questions while we're working through this, please feel free to drop those questions in the YouTube chat. And then Diane will be fielding all of that and uh, stopping us along the way if we have uh, to uh, address those questions. Uh, we are happy to help with this uh, in any way that we can. And uh, we're not going to answer all of the questions you might have this morning. This is an overview of a lot of things. And in some ways, it may feel like you're drinking from a fire hose. Uh, but that's why it's great to be able to have this video to go back on and to, and to look through. So with that having been said, I'm going to go ahead and start working my way through this. So we're going to talk about ways to get started with the Savas platform. And so I'll talk about that just briefly. So if you're familiar with traditional textbooks, you'll know that there's a textbook company and they gather people together and um, work, work to create units and develop materials that can be used in a classroom. That's, that's the content. Well, yes, Savas has done this, um, but what we have also done is developed our own platform uh, that we call a content delivery platform, where all of that material is then delivered. There's a thin line between content delivery and learning management. We're not going to get too much into that today, but we do want you to know that everything that would be in a traditional textbook and that is actually in the print textbooks is on the Savas Realize platform. And so you'll hear us talk about a couple of things today. You'll hear the term My Perspectives. That is the curriculum itself for ELA. And then you'll also hear the term Realize or the Savas platform. That is the online world in which all of the content or My Perspectives lives. So let's get started with just some of the basics. What it looks like when you log on to the Savas Realize platform and how you navigate some of it. As we start to think about these things, I really want to reiterate the relationship between the Savas Realize platform and the different parts that underlie the philosophy of Jefferson County Schools, but also the philosophy in Kentucky. So we start by thinking about the Kentucky core standards, the core academic standards, and what the, how they lay out the framework for what students are supposed to learn. This is something everyone should be familiar with. Uh, I remember when I was teaching in Kentucky um, for several years, uh, helping to work to revise different things, uh, working on portfolios and, and so on. Um, so I know a lot of people are very grounded in those standards. And then JCPS, you all have done such a fine job of thinking about what your curriculum frameworks look like and how they are built around those core standards. And so that starts to take the what students are supposed to learn and think about the how they're going to learn it. Then we insert our Savas Realize platform. And this is not teaching for you. This is simply the platform, like I said earlier, where the content that's going to be taught lives. This is in no way meant to replace any of the teaching that happens. Um, this is simply the content. And then we think about how that content is going to be delivered. 
and that is the instructional framework that JCPS has worked so hard to develop and the professional development and professional expectations that you all as speakers have for one another. Um, and so we start with what students are going to learn, with the standards, how they're going to learn it with the curriculum, what it is they're learning specifically about their content with the Savas Realize platform where it lives, and then how that content is going to be delivered uh, with the instructional framework. So when you log in to the Savas Realize platform, you will land on a page that looks something like this. Yours will be a little bit different because you might have chosen a different background and you get to choose. I did the bales of hay because I grew up on a farm in Eastern Kentucky. And if you look under the browse area here, your texts may be different. You see on this page, I have Reading Street Common Core Grade One. Yes, this is the middle school training. Uh, this just happens to be the uh, one that I have access to that I'm showing on my screen is, is for grade one. This is where, this is your bookshelf. And this is where all of the different textbooks to which you have access live under the browse. Uh, then you have the classes, and that is pretty much your grade book where you will be able to look and see your rosters. You'll be able to look and see assignments. You'll be able to look at grades student performance, and so on. And then we have data, where you will be able to dig into specifics of test scores. You'll be able to look also at how long students have spent on a task, and so on. The other things we'll look at today are the My Library. What's nice about the My Library is yes, there are things on this platform that you will grab, but there's also ways to upload your own material to this so that you can manage all of that on here as well. And then we'll start talking, we'll spend some time, I'm sorry, talking about uh, other things related to your management of the platform. In the top right hand corner here, you can see uh, these options. So we've walked through the browse that was your, um, your library, the classes, which is your grade book, the data, which is of course where all the results and outcomes of the student work will live. My library, where you can catalog materials from this website as well as upload your own we'll walk through the notifications, the help, and the personal settings. I do wanna point out real quickly before we move on, as you navigate throughout the entire platform, these circles disappear, but you do keep this black bar at the top of your screen. And that will help you come back to these main places. You'll see that as you work through the program. So let's spend some time talking about how you browse what's on your bookshelf. So we're back on this screen and we're going to be clicking on that browse button and you see it also has its analog in the top. It's going to look something like this. So you can see that the My Perspectives ELA, which are the grades 6 through 12 English program, are all starred on mine because those are the, that's the platform with which I work most often. And I have it organized with these stars because at the top I've clicked to organize it by favorites. This probably won't be a big issue for you because you may only be accessing two or three, maybe grades six, seven, and eight. But I do want you to see all the different ways that this can be organized. The final thing I'll point out, and I don't have it circled, is you should have access to this Black My Perspectives Plus here at the bottom. If you do not, you'll need to contact someone and um, get that. But I'm going to show you something here in a little bit where you can do it yourself. Um, and uh, it's, it's one of the more common questions that I get because there's lots of materials in here that aren't specific to a grade level, but that are very helpful. Now let's take just a moment and talk about what you see under classes and assignments. So again, we're back on the main page with my bales of hay here. And we're going to click on the classes button. Once you click on the classes button, you see I have ninth grade courses here that are um, my mock courses. You'll be, you'll, you will see all of the courses that you have assigned to you, just like if you were opening a regular learning management program. I've enlarged this so that you can see all the different options across these bars. If you click on assignments, 
it will take you into another menu that lists all of the assignments for that class. And here you can also sort separately. You can sort assignments by class, as you see here. So these are all of the assignments given to this particular class. Or you can click assignments by student. And I clicked ahead too far. If you click assignments by student, then you actually see a listing of students in the class. You see assignment status, and you can click on these to see more specific details. If we go back to that grade bar, you can also click on calendar. This calendar feature is one of my favorite features, and it's just for teachers. Students do not have a calendar like this on the Savas Realize platform. But here you can see on this calendar, and it's pretty sparse because it's just a model, that it actually lists assignments on the day that those assignments are due. So teachers can see how things have been overlaid, and all of these are also live. So you can click on these, and it takes you to specifics related to that assignment. Now, I do wish that instead of just on the day due, it showed overlapping, like this is the day I'm assigning it and this is when it's due. Uh, that's a common question I get. I wish I had that one uh, as well. I wish I had uh, that feature on here as well. And it is something I've pushed forward uh, to our technology people. So they're working on that. And that was looking at classes. And that though there are many more things you could dig into there, those are the basics of working with the classes right now. Now let's look at data and mastery. Now, if there were a couple of more things with the classes into which we could have gone, there's a lot more with data and mastery. We can go pretty deep in this and then forget where you are. So we're only gonna look at a few options here that about representing data in basic ways, uh, but know that there are many different ways you can look in, at, at the data as we click through. So we're gonna go back to our main page and we're gonna click on this blue data circle. And it brings up a page that looks similar to the classes because it's organized by class, but you see the options on the bar are different. If you click class results by assignment, and before we go into this, I want you to know that I don't have a full mock class in here. It's only a few students, so it's not gonna be representative of what a full mock class would look like. But you get a large screen with lots of options here. So I've enlarged some of these so that you can see exactly what you're looking at. The first option you see is scores, and it's average scores on completed tests. You can see that it color codes those. You can see a, a bar for the a line for the mean. And each of these bars is live. So you can click on that or mouse over it and see details related to it. If I mouse over it, I see things like I see at the bottom, the name of it, the date it was due, the class average. If I click on it, it takes me to a separate screen where I can actually look at specific details related to that test. The next thing we have is progress. And it, you can see it's class or group completion of assignments. It's just completion. This is not a progress for mastery. This is a progress on completion of assignments. You can, you see it tracked in detail above. You see a longer term chart at the bottom and you have the ability to move the gray box, shrink it, enlarge it, slide it along the line so that you can see the detail at the top. So this representation of the gray box is enlarged above to more detail. And these things are also live. So you can click on those and see things that were expected or things that were done and even start digging into individual students, et cetera. The final one at the bottom here is probably one of my favorite things. And that is the average time spent on a task per student. So this is great to be able to see, as you know, if the student doesn't do well on something you've asked them to do and you look and they spent five minutes on the platform. Uh, the platform also does have a timeout feature after so long, if they're not active, it'll kick them off and you can see that as well. Uh, and you see how that is marked timed out due to inactivity. None of those are marked here. And same as the chart before, I have a longer term chart below. I can move my field focus and get a more particular 
chart above, and I can click on these items as well to see what they were working on. And I also see mean time here in the middle. The other thing you can click on here is class mastery by standard. This is another place where it's easy to get so deep into it that you can't remember where you started. That happens on Wikipedia a lot with me and other people I know. So you click on that class mastery by standard and you're going to get a, a, a screen that simply goes across and lists all the standards on which students have been assessed on tests this year. And this student here, Sturgill Simpson is a, a musician I like, so I just made a class full of musicians I like. This student has encountered four questions related to this standard. That doesn't mean that that student has encountered four questions on just one test. They've encountered four questions across any number of tests. And for this particular standard, that student has 100% mastery. So you think, well, that makes sense. Four correct out of four, 100%. We'll look over here. Three out of four, but it still says 100%. And this is simply because the line between mastery and grading. You have the ability with your PLCs and with your within your school to set what you think the mastery standard should be. The default is 70% because that tends to be the, def uh, the default with most assessment people and most statisticians. Um, so even though Sturgill here has only gotten 75% correct, he's above that 70% threshold. So it shows that he's mastered that skill. It's nice as you move along, I can dive deeper and look at individual standards. If I click on the four by four, it takes me to a screen where I can sort through each question, see question information, see the standard related to it. And when I'm start clicking on the standard, it will also show me things where I can, that I can use that are already within the Savas Realize platform to remediate that student's performance. One other thing that's worth noting, you see it says question one of three, but here it says there were four questions addressing that. That's telling me that one of these questions was probably a two part A, B question, which counts, in which case each question counts towards mastery, even though on the test it only counted as one question. You can also, as you dive into this, look at how many students got that question right, how many students missed that question. And you can even, as you start sorting through the mastery percentages, you can even see students who scored below a certain level on a particular standard, see a chart of that, and assign particular remediation activities to those students. And that's looking at data. Again, I could spend an entire hour on just the data. Now let's look briefly at the library and playlist because I know Suzanne is going to come back and talk about this a little bit more later because the, the playlists are such a powerful tool. I do want to look at what your options are here with the library and the playlists. So if you click on library, you can see that I have lots of different options here. And these are all things that I have either edited or uploaded myself because over here on the left hand side, you have several options. You can upload a file. You can add your own link. You can build a test, you can write an essay prompt, or you can create a playlist. The nice thing about it is any of these things that you upload or add or build can then be added to their own playlists. And those playlists are ways of gathering materials you know you want to use all in one place and then using those as you teach a particular standard or a particular skill or a particular text. The analogy I like to use is the old school file cabinets when I had manila folders that had all the materials I wanted to use and I would pull them out a couple of weeks before I started the unit and go through them and put them in order and know I want to do this and this and this and uh, leave it on my desk. Sometimes those manila folders would graduate into three ring binders. Um, if you've been teaching, uh, if you are a teacher of a certain age, you remember those things and um, you, uh, you might even miss some of your file folders. I do. So you have options to upload a file, like I said, 
you can attach it from a computer, attach it from Google Drive. You have options to add a link. So maybe there's a particular video you want to use from YouTube or from TeacherTube or some other video site. And here you can see I've created a playlist, grade nine, unit three, whole group learning. And for it's Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream. And then that there would be things that I would want to use in teaching that. I have them all in one place. We'll do more diving into that in just a few minutes. Let's talk through these options at the top right hand of the screen before we move on. We have a couple of things here. We have notifications. This is where any really important information related to the program will come through to you. Uh, I encourage people to check on that every now and then too. It may not be pushed through, but there's ways to see updates and as we're constantly making updates to this. Uh, one of my most exciting updates, um, you know, I'm allowed to be excited about PDFs, but just recently they've changed it to where any PDF on here, you students can now complete on the platform instead of downloading it and doing it and re-uploading it. It's a huge update. Next is the help. This is a pretty standard help page, uh, sorry, help menu. So I'm not gonna go over all the options for it. Um, I'm careful with the search help because you can almost get into too much, but I do wanna highlight this program training because it takes you directly to our MySavas training website where there is almost any question you could ask addressed on here. Um, you can simply search for my perspectives or even search for realize if you have questions about the platform itself. There's videos, there's click through menus, everything. It's really helpful. And then finally, these are your personal settings. You see here's my name and a couple of options. The main thing I want to focus on is settings. You get a large menu like this, but you really want to look at the very bottom, which is where you're going to be connecting Google, where you will uh, be connecting Google Classroom. And uh, you'll hear more about that from um, your digital innovations people. Um, but you see it, it's a one-to-one -one relationship. Anything that you do on Google Classroom, you see here. Anything you do here, you see on Google Classroom. We are so excited about that. Uh, and as a Google certified teacher myself, I'm super excited about it. And then up at the top here, you see you have a couple of tabs. Earlier I mentioned if you weren't seeing a program that you would like to see or you weren't seeing My Perspectives Plus, this I would show you where you can add it. This is where you would do that. You click on My Programs, it opens up a large menu. Yours may not be this large because I have access to all the programs. But it'll, you'll open up these menus and you can go down and select different, different things to which you'd like to have access, including different My Perspectives ELA uh, programs or the My Perspectives Plus and then you would make sure to save at the bottom. So that's covering all of the, what I call peripherals, uh, but they are pretty useful at the top here. So that was pretty much the basics of how to navigate the different parts of the program. I did not get into ELA content really. Uh, there's so much to get into here, uh, but because I'm not a JCPS expert and don't know all that's going on with your old curriculum frameworks and your old instructional frameworks, it's really best that one of your experts in-house take care of that. And that's exactly what Suzanne is going to take over and do. So you'll bear with us just for a moment while I stop sharing and hand it over to Suzanne. Thanks, Brandon, so much. Um, and thank you all again for being here this morning. Um, I'm going to share my screen and we're going to talk a little bit um, about how we can plan in using our um, JCPS curriculum framework, using the platform, um, some ways to build out playlists. Um, and then Elaine is gonna go on and share some really great information about Google Classroom and how it integrates. So give me just a second to share my screen and we will get started on some unit design. are all aware um, we have many instructional design tools that we can use 
to pull together unit design or module design in ELA. And so I've linked those here, and this slide deck will be available on the digital learning panel um, schedule for you all to take a look at. Um, and so, of course, we start with our curriculum frameworks for literacy, instructional framework. Um, we've had some training on the standards of construction and unit planning as part of the PLC process. We know that Think Circa can be a great supplementary resource for writing and integrated reading and writing um, instruction. And then um, today we're going to talk about how we can use the Realize platform um, to make our delivery more efficient, to have access to all digital content, um, and to develop some really great designs for students. And so um, before we get into um, the nuts and bolts of this designing process with our frameworks, um, I wanted us to have a mental model of how we should conceptualize a robust and holistic ELA curriculum. Um, and we know we need to have core instruction with worthy complex text sets that scaffold. Um, we should have choice and volume reading, independent reading with personalized um, performances like genius hours or passion projects, digital reading, writing notebooks. Um, and that sometimes or often can also be a part of this core instruction and sometimes it happens in parallel. Um, and then of course we have those laps of substantive composition that connect um, with both pieces here, designed with the student, the community, the context at the center. And so how do we get to this holistic curriculum? Well, for independent reading, we know our library media services colleagues have um, developed trainings and supported us in partnership with the Sora app where we can add the Louisville Free Public Library catalog. Many of our schools have OverDrive. Um, we have independent reading choice boards and again, that reading writing notebook to support that part. And for writing, we should see um, a connection between that reading writing notebook um, and those little seeds of writing that are happening all along the way, the laps of writing that we have going on, and then of course, performance tasks um, and think circa. And then to design that core instruction with worthy complex text, we're going to use our JCPS curriculum frameworks. And today we're going to learn about how my perspective um, can support in that core design. So again, we're coming back to this graphic for planning, um, where we begin with the standards and the frameworks. Um, and then today we're going to really focus on how my perspectives can come into that planning process and will show how the standards, frameworks, my perspectives can all come together into a coherent um, instructional design. And I'll show you um, a possible week of instruction. We'll show you some unit level instructional designs. Um, but this is sort of our mental model for planning um, using these resources. So we have already done um, curriculum framework crosswalks with you, uh, for you. So what you'll see here for middle school ELA, um, on the left hand side, you'll see the compelling question um, for from the curriculum framework some of the choices for compelling questions that PLCs can use for design. You'll see the focus standard, and then you'll see an alignment to the My Perspectives unit that most closely connects in um, topic, theme, and standard, and performance to what we have in the curriculum framework. And then you will also see the Think Circa writing lessons that then align with that My Perspectives unit. And so we have those for you for sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Those are ready to go. Um, and so if we start with our curriculum framework, we're looking at those compelling questions and standards. This is going to show um, how we can have coherence when we're using the My Perspectives unit um, to ensure an equity of experience. And so there are probably more strands than this, but we really wanted to call out three possible strands or the way in which we approach design. And so the first one on the left, we all know this. How do we plan using the JCPS curriculum frameworks? Well, we use that backward design process, planning um, from performance back through the process, establishing our purpose, right? 
So we um, here I pulled out a possible skeletal unit design from the curriculum framework for eighth grade module four. So the compelling question I chose was how far have we come? I have some book club choices um, that represent um, this idea, how far have we come at, in different historical periods. Um, and I have some great text that I think would be really engaging and powerful um, to really focus on an anti-racist pedagogy for our eighth grade students in Stamped, Between the World and Me, and actually all of these together are, are moving toward a more anti-racist pedagogy. So um, we have these book club choices, then we are layering in um, spoken word, poetry, art, digital media. Um, in our first lap of composition, then, um, this is where we pull together um, these texts with the composition. So we're not just reading all of these things and then writing an essay at the end. What we should be doing is writing alongside these texts, using them to mentor our thinking and to mentor our craft. And so in the first lap, we see Think Circa's, uh, a Think Circa a writing lesson. In lap two, we are analyzing um, a speech. And then in lap three, we are taking all of these pieces we have learned, these themes, these perspectives, um, and integrating them um, into a commencement address of our own, perhaps, as a transfer task, or um, an argument that leverages narrative um, and poetry. So that's planned using the curriculum frameworks. That's one possible pathway that you could take from our eighth grade module four framework. Now, over on the right-hand side, um, when we look back at this crosswalk, um, when we looked at the eighth grade crosswalk, we would have noticed that for eighth grade module four, it's aligned to unit three in my perspective. So this shows um, if we were to teach using the digital content in my perspective on the platform, that this would um, be our whole and small group text and learning, our independent learning, and then these are the performance tasks that we um, put into labs. Um, in the center, what I've tried to do, and this is kind of what we're going to focus on today, is how do we integrate the frameworks in the my perspective um, content to have a really um, robust and holistic design. And so here, I've chosen um, this question from the curriculum framework, when is a risk worth taking? I've pulled in this My Perspective content, and then these excerpts from the JCPS curriculum framework, and then again, poetry, art, and digital media from the JCPS curriculum framework. And then I've built out these laps of composition that work alongside the reading. And so here you can see both pieces coming together in, in this integration um, for a really strong um, unit design here. And what we're gonna talk about next is how we take this skeletal unit design and develop playlists um, that we can deliver to students and how that connects to an instructional framework. And so, um, I went ahead and I did build out the unit playlist and I'm going to show you that in platform here in a second. Um, but these are the pieces that we need to know. So we are in my library, like Brandon shared with us, there's the black fire across the screen that's always there. Um, we create a playlist and I think the naming convention that we use for the play playlist can be really important. I would suggest establishing, um, a naming convention that can tell you um, the the level, like the time period, how long it is, when, um, what module, uh, maybe is it a week, is it a lap, is it the full unit? I think having a common naming convention um, can really support um, this tool being effective for you. Um, and so here we would create a playlist, which I did, eighth grade module four integrated unit. Um, in order to add the resources from the curriculum framework, like the Human Eye Project, like Think Circa, I, ut I utilize the add a link feature. Um, and then in order to add the content from my perspective, I would go over here to the browse feature, go into the unit resources, 
and add them to the playlist. And so I'm gonna show you um, in just a, just a second here, as soon as I can get it up, um, how to create a playlist. Um, and then I'm gonna add something to this unit level playlist um, that to, to show you how to do that. So give me just a second. Suzanne, we had a, a really good question I wanted to go for in the chat. And um, Diane, we, we both, we were both like, mm, I don't know, I'm not sure. But Sandra, um, Dr. Hogue, she she answered it for us. But Nicole Adele said, uh, would my perspectives replace, for example, her EL education? Um, and Sandra said, um, it is a choice to support your EL core, not, not replace necessarily your teachers are already using the EL. Um, and the perspectives may support that resource, just a, use a strategic placement around that. Yes, and so um, I know at Newburgh, they have established EL as their um, primary resource for ELA, and they're moving right along with delivery of that content through Google Classroom. And of course, um, they are welcome to continue with that if it's meeting the needs of their school and community. And um, so, my perspectives is also a primary core resource. And so you wouldn't, I mean, there may be ways that there are resources that could support, but you probably wouldn't need both. Um, and schools definitely should keep doing what they're doing if they're happy um, and it's supporting their students' learning and what their teachers need. So um, in, in the platform, I'm gonna go to my library and here we can see all of the pieces that I added to my library to build out the playlist. Um, and so here is my eighth grade module four playlist. And you can see that I have ordered it such that the laps are apparent. So we could um, build out this unit level playlist and we could put due dates um, that reflect how we want the laps to work. Um, or we can create additional playlists one lap at a time or one week at a time. It's totally up to the teacher um, how they want their cadence to work. But what you can see here is the content in lap one, the content in lap two, and then the content in lap three that builds toward this multi-genre research paper. Um, so you could again just use the entire unit in this way or you can build out then weekly playlists from this um, we probably don't want to assign all of a unit to a student at one time that would probably be pretty overwhelming but just one thing i wanted to call out to you um, when you are adding things to the playlist you might not necessarily have them in the order you want them to teach if you want to change the order, you just go to edit and you can move this text to here, right? And so I tried to keep mine in the order I wanted to teach it because that helped me um, conceptualize the laps. And then you can save it and they'll be in the place that you wanted. If I wanted to add something to my playlist, right here. Again, um, I love the nice place. I would add a link to add something from our curriculum frameworks, um, or I could upload a file. And if I wanted to add content from the My Perspectives curriculum, I would go to Browse. Eighth grade, because we're talking about eighth, eighth grade module four. And in our alignment, we want to look at unit three. And then if I wanted to add this text, for example, all I would need to do here, add the playlist. And then my, my playlist for the integrated unit is here and I would click add and it would appear in my playlist. So again, in my library, to create the playlist, you click here. To add curriculum framework resources, you upload a file, add a link. Um, and to add my perspectives content, you go to the unit resources in the browse. 
portion of the platform. Um, and we also have built in like an end of week, quick little synthesis check using this essay prompt. Um, and, and that's in this playlist as well. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. So we talked about the what of the content that we're teaching and how to build out those units. Um, and this portion is going to be about the workshop. How does that look in a digital setting? And so um, we have created um, this great resource that shows our instructional framework in a digital setting, the asynchronous, the synchronous, the tool um, that you can use uh, for each section. And remember, when we are in that cadence, it's really important to think about the balance of synchronous versus asynchronous. And then what tool are we matching with the task? We're not just doing tech to do the tech, but how are we leveraging Greencastify? How are we using the better lesson dialogical strategies or protocols to ensure that synchronous meetings include student voice and not just teacher voice? Um, and so this is a really great resource um, for you all to begin to conceptualize our, our instructional framework in a digital setting. So this is the framework that we're all familiar with, but in a digital setting. Here is that framework conceptualized in a week-long space. We know that our reading, writing, or literacy workshops cannot happen in a single day during virtual instruction. It needs to be spread out over the course of the week, but we shouldn't be eliminating parts of the workshop. And so this just shows, here's how that opening activity and that guiding purpose could happen on a Monday. Here's where the guide and engage appears um, asynchronously with those mini lessons in Screencastify. Here is the exploration and application portion that students are engaged in. And then here is that closure, that synthesis and reflection that can be done asynchronously on a Friday. So we hope that this will kind of help teachers in thinking about how to get in that cadence of weekly planning um, and, and really see those elements of the workshop working intentionally um, during synchronous and asynchronous instruction. And so the instructional framework that's built into the My Perspectives curriculum um, looks a little bit different, but it has similar elements. And so I wanted to talk through that a little bit. So when we look at the curriculum in the teacher's guide, you're going to see something like this that shows those texts, whole class learning, small group, and then work that students do um, independently. Now, we know that quality whole class instruction doesn't just mean lecture. So this is where that catch and release um, really comes into play and the better lesson strategies come into play. And so this whole class learning could have asynchronous and synchronous elements. During the synchronous elements, we could do be doing a fishbowl. Asynchronously, we could be doing a silent conversation. Um, so still within this whole class learning, we want to see effective pedagogy. Um, and then of course it has built in the small group learning and independent. Now in my unit design, um, I actually chose some of the small group text to um, function as whole group and then um, would provide small group support. Um, that's okay. You just need to be cognizant of the supports that are with that text um, or the tasks in platform um, and you may need to modify modify that. And so here we have the JCPS um, instructional framework that we're all familiar with um, alongside the My Perspective Unit organization. And so they both have the gradual release. This one is just more across the unit, whereas ours has a spiraled and more cyclical release daily, but also across the unit. Um, and so we just wanted to give you those definitions um, so you could see them side by side. Um, and then this note is really important. Um, regardless of, of where this is happening, we should still have components of our SIF um, 
in, in our digital classrooms across the week. And so the last thing um, that I wanted to show you, so we took this middle column and we had a unit design um, that was designed around um, the students in our classroom. Um, and we integrated resources from both places. And we created a unit level playlist. But then the question is, how do I get to the delivery? Um, and so we wanted to show you what a week of instruction could look like within that unit design. And so what I did is I took resources that I had pulled together in the unit design and I developed one week of instruction. And so you can see here, we're going to use um, this mock storytelling video. Um, we're going to use the human eye project. And in both cases, we're going to use that repeated reading, which is a really, really important piece. Um, that repeated reading with the first read, second read, first read is inherent to all of the resources in my perspective. And it's a really good practice that we could be using with the text that we're using as well. And so um, in this particular case, the text that's in the platform has these resources, some vocabulary, the first review, a comprehension check, a close read, some analysis. And so we're gonna do all of these things um, with that first text in a balance of synchronous and asynchronous instruction. Um, and then we're sort of going to apply that same process um, to this human eye project. Um, it's, a, it's a TED Ed talk um, about an art. It's a sort of a, it's not, it's a social art, a social justice um, art piece that's really, really interesting. Um, and so what I've done here is I've added this first review media guide um, that I had over here that we used with this. I added it so that students are going to do that same organizer. They're going to do an continue with their evidence log. And then at the end of the week, they're going to synthesize, right? So we have repeated and close reading with graphic organizers and note catchers, the same process here, and then a synthesis at the end of the week with dialogue built in. And I'm going to show you how um, that could look in a week of instruction. And so here again, we have our classroom instructional framework. Um, across the week, but this actually shows the content that we're teaching from this unit design, from this sample playlist. So we have the whole group asynchronous on Monday, posting all the assignments for the week, that essential question, a jam board for students to explore that big idea and maybe the vocabulary. We have the first dream, we have the students' independent work. And then I kind of show when we're having the small groups, what's synchronous, what's asynchronous. Um, and then of course we should have that independent volume reading happening all along the way. And what you'll see here is again, remember when we talked about that whole group, small group, whole group, synchronous learning does not mean teachers talking at students. We want student voice to be elevated in our classroom particularly our digital classrooms, we know that protocols are a great tool for democratizing the classroom. And so in this whole group instruction, we have built in these better lesson resources, um, which show students engaging um, in this in an in-person space. And then also if you click on Fishbowl for distance learning, it gives step-by-step -step instruction or how to implement that with videos. And so we've also built in those instructional tools to our whole and small group learning here so that you can see what a week of instruction would look like given this eighth grade module four unit design that we've created using both the curriculum frameworks and the My Perspectives resources. And so with that, I think that wraps up my portion. And Elaine, if there were no questions in the chat, I think that's it. I really hope um, that teachers can see the potential of how the playlist functionality could um, make their design more efficient um, and 
see how our curriculum frameworks and those questions in that design can be brought to bear with these resources from my perspective. Suzanne, um, would you want to make note of uh, the essay prompt, the thing that we found out about the essay prompt where it got lost? Oh, yes. Um, so let me go back. So here we created this little writing prompt to be a synthesis of these two pieces together just as a closure for the week. However, what we discovered when we created it in platform, I'm going to go over here. So we created that essay prompt um, for the end of week. And of course, it wouldn't have to be a whole essay. It could be just a smaller response. But we created the prompt here. And we put in the title and we hit save. And then we couldn't find it anywhere. Um, and so right now it's not appearing in the library and so to find your essay prompt to add it to the playlist you have to search for it and then this is Brandon I'll chime in you know we literally discovered this yesterday I've been working with this platform for so long uh, but um, when you sent the question I went and tried it five or six times myself and it was killing me and so uh, we are working on that, trying to make that change. Uh, and that's exactly the kind of feedback we look to get uh, if you all encounter other things like this. And so then you can see here's the essay prompt and then you could add it to your playlist. So just know that if you add in um, some sort of little writing piece that you want to put um, as synthesis or as one of your laps that you might feel frustrated because, oh, it's not in my library. Well, you have to go get it with the search tool and then you can go ahead and add it to your playlist and then it'll be there. So thanks for bringing that up, Diane. That's just a little workaround um, and hopefully it'll be fixed soon. Awesome. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, Thank you. Uh, we are going to go on and move on. And so now how, after you've learned all about that, uh, with Brandon and Suzanne, how are you going to start this process and in getting it integrated into your Google Classroom? Connect them. So what we need to do is you first go to your Clever. And if for some reason uh, you do not see the JCPS quick links up in the top left corner of your Chrome browser, uh, you can go to the far right and look for uh, double arrows. It's really a double greater than signs and you uh, will ha have that that drop down and you can move it if you want um, sometimes those get lost but once you find that you can go on to clever and then you find your Savas uh, icon now if you hover over any of these icons within clever you will see a heart and you can click on the heart and that'll make it a favorite and it will go back up to this um, favorites bar so you'll make sure that you uh, Mark that as a favorite so it can go on um, to the top and you won't have to search for it. So once you've selected that uh, Savas icon, you're going to want to go on, go ahead and uh, click on the classes. The first and prompt. This will appear and it's going to prompt you to add classes. Go ahead, click import classes from Google Classroom. And once uh, you We'll click that it's going to ask for verification to use your account you want to make sure that you're using your jcps account um, and this is just a, a normal thing that happens when you add anything to your google account after you've linked your google account you're going to see a list of all the active google classrooms that you have that are provisioned from infinite campus we want to add the savas realize programs to those classes and um, you can only do this uh, one class at a time. Very similar to when we would do our backpack and we had to, uh, we would link those uh, one at a time as well. So after that, you're going to select all of the programs that you want with that will correspond with that class. Um, and then after that you have selected all the programs, go ahead and click import class. You can go back and add or um, so take away things if you need at a later time. So after you've finished adding and all of your resources, you will then go to um, 
imported, you can add re realized programs to the rest of your classes and then click finish and view classes. When you have imported all of your Google Classrooms, click the blue button once that it will appear. So once you have imported all your Google Classrooms, you will see them under the classes tab in Savas, like this screenshot below. There are other options for these classes from here. You'll see the assignments, the calendar, which Brandon spoke to us earlier about as well. And you can hide any old classes if you don't want to see them on a regular um, on your screen. And you can add more classes um, from this view as well. So now to add some assignments to these classes, you're going to want to make sure that you add assignments from the Savas portal only. You don't need to go back to adding anything to an assignment through Google Classroom. Make sure you're doing everything through Savas. The first time assignments are added, teachers will click on that assignments tab and explore those programs. Then if you want to add an additional assignments under browse, select the program you want to add to your Google Classroom and then find that content you can to add to your class. You can view the content in the thumbnail or as a list view. Once you have located your assignments, go ahead and click assign to your class, your Google Classroom, and then edit the title, start date, just as you would normally uh, in the due date. Make sure you select the class that you want to add this assignment to Google Classroom and click assign. So when you're back in the view you can and click on assignments, you'll see the completion of the entire class or by individual student. So students that have not gone into the Google Classroom and synced themselves with Savas, you'll note that it says that it needs to connect, so you might need to prompt them to do so. If you do have any co-teachers in your Google Classroom, they um, will have all the same permissions that you have um, in assigning assignments to Savas classes as well. They too will need to go through those beginning steps of um, connecting their Google Classrooms to Savas. All right, so after we've given assignments, how are we going to um, assess and grade? So the students um, are going to, or access, how are they gonna access these from Google Classroom? So they're going to enter through Google Classroom and that assignment will pop up automatically because it goes from Savas to Google Classroom. You don't have to do that, it's just by magic. Um, the student will go in there and click on that link and they will be automatically redirected to the Savas platform or digital curriculum. Now they're also too going to need to um, accept permissions and this is just a one-time thing just as you had to do as well. Students going to want to make sure they're clicking their JCPS account and not any other account that may be tethered to that device. So once they've launched it, they're ready to um, finish setting up their account. Um, they can choose their preferred language. And of course, um, customize that profile icon. And um, there's that background um, for the home page that they can as well customize. So they're ready to go. Once they do that, they can click on Let's Go. And now how are the students going to turn in their work with Savas? They're going to find access um, through the Google Classroom, as I said below earlier. And then once they do that, they're going to click it and it'll redirect them to Savas. They will find that assigned work in the Savas um, window as well. After students have completed their work, they're just going to click turn in. And if they have any additional things to attach um, as examples of their learning, they can attach the file either from their computer, um, their Google Drive, or their Microsoft um, OneDrive. They can also add any uh, comments um, to it if they need to that will go directly to you. They'll get that prompt again to say, um, are you sure you want to turn it in? And yes, they will want to make sure that they click turn in. And then after they've turned in an assignment, it's going to turn green, so with a check mark, so that they can feel confident that it's already been turned in. 
How are you going to grade the work within the Savas platform in Google Classroom? So you can add comments, you can review and score right there, but you're going to want to make sure you do it all within the Savas platform. So as students do complete the assignments, they are automatically graded in Savas. So it's automatically going to be connected to Google Classroom, which is that magic that is very nice and exciting. So the last thing we have here is on this, uh, on this slide, we have a, a tip sheet for you uh, that uh, Stephen Derms created with our team and uh, there are some videos linked here as well as some other resources that you can um, have access to easily. Uh, make sure that you check out this slide deck so that you um, can keep this um, handy if you need it. So that's pretty much it team. Um, we are so glad that you joined us this morning and remember you have the power of pause. I'm going to check our chat real quick, make sure I didn't miss anything. All right. Um, we're glad that you uh, joined us this morning and you do have that power of pause. If you uh, need to go back, rewind and, and view it again. But um, I do want to say if you come back at 1230, you're going to have high school um, math, which will be uh, showed and training with uh, that team as well. Does anybody else have anything to say? Or we're all good? No, thanks, Elaine, for emceeing and, and running everything. And thanks, Brandon, for being here and Diane for monitoring the chat. Um, and just um, anyone that's watching, if y'all have questions or, or need any support, please just reach out to us and we will um, help you move forward with your plans.